Hi, welcome to WesleyGospel.com. Today I'm going to talk about um, Chapter 3 from How to Experience God on Contemplation or Divine Contemplation or Christian Contemplation. And just starting off, um, I, I, I don't want you to be scared that I'm talking about something pagan or New Age um, or yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not talking about that. Um, the immediate basis of, of what I'm talking about, it can be found in uh, Richard Foster's book, um, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, um, page 264. I think it was chapter 14. He had a chapter on contempt, contemplative prayer. And essentially what's going on here is we are importing the teaching on contemplation from the Catholic saints. Okay, so if you're afraid of Catholic or saints or Catholic saints, we're not talking about praying to Catholic saints, okay? We're, we're talking about the Catholic saints were real people that lived in the medieval times and in the dark ages. Uh, they were real Christians. Um, so most, most Christians today, uh, when they look back into the past, um, they think of, you know, Maybe they have a subscription to uh, Christian book distributors, and they might see biographies of different missionaries, Protestant missionaries from the past, like Eric Liddell or William Booth or John Wesley or, or, or things like that, Hudson Taylor. These are the, you know, the traditional 1800s Protestant missionaries we always look back to as like, oh wow, wouldn't that be so great to to be like those people? And and it is true, it's, it's true. Those those people were saints, uh, and and uh, but the the model of the Protestant missionary, um, especially from homeschooling and and stuff like this, is kind of like what we've been conditioned to to think of is like the model Christian to aim at. Okay. So when somebody starts talking about Catholic saints, there's like almost like a, almost like a red flag goes off in in people. It's like if they're not a Catholic, they're like, "What Catholic saints? What are you even talking about?" You know, it's just it's so foreign to them um, because they uh, they don't they don't know about that. What it, what is that? You know, and on top of that. Um, you know the Catholic Church has so many doctrines that are wrong with it um, that have accumulated over the years. Um, you know, it's pro a lot of Protestants just feel like it's just safer just to avoid it altogether. Um, and uh, there's the um, there's the there's this documentary by Chick Publications called Messages from Heaven, which goes through, you know, all the demonic visions of the Virgin Mary and all this stuff. And and I think that that's a good video. I've watched it several times. But again, uh, if, if you've done what I've done, and that is that you've read the Catholic saints, you've read about their lives. You're going to find that they had all the elements of Hudson Taylor and William Booth and these, you know, these Protestant missionaries. It's just that they had this supernatural element that's missing in those guys' stories. You might say, well, Hudson Taylor and all these people, they had supernatural. Yeah, but this was like a hundred times more supernatural experiences. So the Catholic saints are essentially missionary stories, missionary biographies. Um, th that have the supernatural element that we're all missing. Um, and so being that as it is, open up your mind just a little bit and allow the Catholic saints to have a place in your theology. And when I say that, I'm not talking about praying to dead saints. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying allow their biographies a place in your the way you think about God and Christianity. And if you're still squinting at what I just said, let me remind you 
let me bring it to your awareness that the pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer has many references, many favorable references to Catholic saints and Catholic mystical spirituality, as did occasionally Leonard Ravenhill's books. If you really dig, you're going to find them. Now, as did John Wesley. Okay. It is a Wesleyan approach to spirituality to allow Catholic saints to have some voice in theology and in understanding God and the Holy Spirit. It is a very Wesleyan approach to theology to do that. And I think it's just a balanced approach if you think about it. Because if we ignore them, we really honestly do lose our sense of the supernatural. They defined, they paved the way. They were able to carve out paths. They were the ones who defined the limits of the supernatural. They were the ones who... Uh, who, who built the skeleton and put meat on the bones of what it means to be a charismatic Christian. What William Seymour did at Azusa Street, oh, there's another example of a guy who borrowed from Catholic saints. Yes, even William Seymour and John G. Lake. Now, uh, John G. Lake was pluralistic. I, I'm not a, fr a fan of John G. Lake in that sense. But even he borrowed from Catholic saints. But the, these early Pentecostals, they borrowed from, they read about Catholic saints and borrowed from them. Okay. Um, all right. So I just wanted to start off by saying that, um, and especially the pursuit of God, which is a very well circulated book among Protestants. There's Catholic, Catholic saint uh, spirituality in that book. Okay, uh, now that I've said that, what is contemplation? What is contemplation and or what is contemplative prayer? This is the, this is the distinctive teaching of the Catholic saints, or some people have controversially come to call them Catholic mystics. As, as to get a little bit more specific, a Catholic mystic is a certain type of Catholic saint that was charismatic. So in other words, it's the old word for Catholic charismatic. Uh, where experiences of the presence of God were going on, people were seeing um, interior mental visions of Jesus, eye, eyes open of Jesus, having tons of dreams, having tons of coincidences happening all around, healings, casting out demons, seeing demons, casting out them, right? Praying for nature, miracles. And they're just their whole life is just one day at a time. I mean, at least if, if not a miracle a day to keep the doctor away, then at least a miracle a week. These guys are just living naturally supernatural lifestyles. John Wimber is another person that comes to mind. He referred to Catholic saints in, in uh, power evangelism. Uh, so uh, now this is going to be very foreign to you if you are a Baptist. Baptists are very anti-Catholic. I understand because the Catholics horribly persecuted Baptists when they were just getting started. But we have to, I mean, get rid of some of these prejudices, I think, if we want to get back to the book of Acts. They can help you to understand the supernatural dimensions of the Holy Spirit way, way better. So contemplation comes from these people. It comes from St. Francis of Assisi, and it comes from uh, St. Anton Antony and the Desert Fathers, these early Catholic saints. And basically all contemplation is, is it's uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for about 15 to 20 minutes in a row. If you go further than this, if you look at chapter 4 of the interior castle by Teresa of Avila, she's going to say, if you do this too long, you can make yourself sick. But it's essentially, be still and know that I am God. Um... And 
it, you're 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 staring at the Lord and you're being still, and you may or may not hear a voice from the Lord, but you're really just you know you're just being still to just be with God. Ecclesiastes 5:2 says, "Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few." Um, so people who try to lump contemplation and contemplative prayer, like Lighthouse Trails, they're one of the most anti-contemplative websites I've seen, Lighthouse Trails. These people are wrong. They're wrong to say that contemplative prayer is Eastern meditation. It is not Eastern meditation. It is European meditation and if anything, Egyptian Christian meditation, but it is not Eastern meditation. It comes from the monasteries of the Catholic Church. That's where it comes from. Um, Eastern meditation comes from Buddhist monasteries way, way, way out there in like Japan and India. Okay, that's Eastern meditation. That's not what this is. All right, there's a very superficial similarity in that you're getting still and you're getting quiet and you're concentrating. But that's about it. Um, this has Jesus in it and Eastern meditation does not. Eastern meditation often has Hindu gods involved in it and stuff. So we're talking about picturing Jesus, picturing the Holy Spirit and being still. That's it. It's that. It's just that simple. And that's the thing about contemplation. It's not complicated. It is the most simple thing you can imagine. And there's also, at the same time, probably when it becomes spirit-filled, probably the most purest experience a human being can ever have because it has the Holy Spirit in it. And I would suggest that Pentecostal and charismatic worship is a form of of contemplation because it has that gazing element where your eyes are shut and you're gazing at the Lord. Now in traditional contemplation there is no speaking in tongues. There's no noise whatsoever. It's just you know concentrating on Jesus in, um, in stillness and maybe either A feeling the Holy Spirit, B hearing a voice, C seeing a mental picture of Jesus' face, or something like that. And of course, you can see a mental picture of a demon trying to distract you. That's true. But then you push it away in Jesus' name and keep on focusing on the Lord. But I'm out, uh, working your way up to 5, 10, and 15 minutes is kind of like the general recommendation I found. Okay, so now what about centering prayer? Okay. And this is where Lighthouse Trails people and these, you know, these anti-contemplation websites that I've seen, these books that preach against contemplative prayer, they've got a point. Centering prayer is a modern innovation that came out of uh, uh, Kentucky, I believe, out of a Catholic, heretical Catholic monastery. Um, and I say heretical Catholic monastery led by the likes of Thomas Merton, Basil Pennington, and Thomas Keating. These are heretical Catholic monks. And you might say, well, if they're heretics, why weren't they kicked out of the Catholic Church? Because since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has been heretical. Since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has been filled with heretics. In the, in the leadership level, they have they have adopted pagan religion and mixed it in with Catholicism. So I, I would have to say any books by Catholic spirituality after 1960 is probably heretical, and you should avoid it. Now, unless it's coming from Tan Books, T-A-N Books. Because T-A-N Books, Tan Books, is a traditionalist Catholic book publisher. But these, uh, this centering prayer came out of this, uh, this pluralistic, um, universalist, religious pluralism 
crowd that's in the Catholic Church. And these are liberal Catholics. And they mix Buddhism in with Catholic prayer. And it's totally heretical. Totally pagan. And uh, and so it would be right. If, if you're just studying contemplative prayer for the first time, you're going to run across these books. And I'd have to say stay away from them. Stay away from any of those names. Thomas Merton, Thomas Keating, M. Basil Pennington, William Menninger. Stay away from those four names. Stay away from any of those books. Stay away from anything that says centering prayer. Stay away from that. It's modern. It's it's new age. It mixes Catholic with Buddhist idea. It mixes yoga, Zen, and Catholic spirituality together. It's heretical. And... Richard Foster, unfortunately, refers to them every once in a while, although he doesn't he doesn't branch off into the pluralistic heresies himself. So you need to be careful of that, because those people are are bringing foreign religions into into prayer, and that's wrong. It's always wrong to do that. Um, but what you're going to find in the traditional Catholic books, I just recently got one that I. I'm looking forward to getting through, and I'll probably review it. This is an oldie, antique book that I got. It's called Divine Contemplation for All by Savinian Luesmet, L-O-U-I-S-M-E-T. It was published in, uh, let's see here, 1920. So it's an old school Catholic book. It's got a lot of Bible verses in it. A lot of books, references to mystical theology. And the things that you're going to see in that type of traditional Catholic uh, mystical theology is occasionally you're going to find references to including the Virgin Mary in your prayer life, which, of course, any Protestant would absolutely hate the sight of that. And here's how I handle that. Ignore it. Because everything else is fine that they're doing. You know they're they're basing their 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 prayer lives on the Bible. They're they're bringing the supernatural element in. Um, this is what the Protestants are missing. Um, Genesis nineteen twenty seven says that Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Now, I personally believe that's talking about contemplation. He's standing up, and he's standing, just standing there before the Lord. There's no um, intercessory prayer, prayer. There's no prayer list he's going through. He's just standing there. Matthew 6.6, 6, Jesus says that when you pray, close your door, lock your door, and be alone. And, and that's an incredibly important aspect. Being alone in solitude with your door shut is extremely important. And whenever I've gotten really serious and disciplined about contemplation, I like to even sometimes use um, earmuffs, like the kind that you would get at the hardware store for mowing the lawn, because it helps you to back, you know, uh, block out the background noise, you know, give a little, give you, give you a little bit of sensory deprivation, so to speak, um, and uh, just like you were, you know, a hermit out in the middle of the desert, you know, experiencing total silence, extremely helpful in helping you to increase your sensitivity to the spirit realm around you. It makes it easier to hear a voice and easier to concentrate on the Lord and easier to see a mental picture pop in the, in the mind. Psalm 62, verse 1, RSV. For God alone my soul waits in silence. What about positions and postures? Again, this is another thing. That, uh, in the Eastern, you don't do any yoga at all. And if you are planning on doing this, and you're doing yoga as an exercise, Stop it and repent from it, okay? Because yoga postures invite evil presence. They invite evil presences. 
whether you're aware of it or not, they do. And they're a cult. The shapes that you make with your body when you do yoga postures, they invite Hindu spirits. And you need to be aware of that. K.P. Yohanan talks about that in Revolution and World Missions. Don't do yoga. Come up with another thing. Go to the gym and get a personal trainer, but don't do yoga. Okay? It's just that simple. There's so many different types of exercises out there to keep yourself fit, lower your blood pressure and all this. You don't need to do yoga. Don't do yoga. So what kind of positions are okay when you're doing Christian, contemplative, Catholic, biblical, contemplative prayer? Well, there's lots in, in, the, in the Bible. Uh, that you can sit cross-legged in a, or in a chair, First Chronicles 17, 16. You can lay prostrate, Leviticus 9, 24. You can bow down, Exodus 34, 8. You can kneel. Ezra 9.5, you can stand, Nehemiah 9.5, you can raise your hands, 1 Timothy 2.8. You can sit before the Lord like David, 1 Chronicles 17.16. Uh, so I, I think there's there's I, that's the most comfortable position for me. It's just, you know, basically you're, you're just sitting Indian style. When I, I don't like the phrase Indian style because that makes you think Hinduism, but you're just sitting cross-legged. Let's just say you're sitting cross-legged on the ground. It's fine. Don't do weird shapes with your fingers. Don't do lotus positions. Now, what's the difference between sitting cross-legged and sitting in a lotus position? The lotus position is where you, you try to actually pull your, pull your feet up on top of your thighs. It's weird. It's awkward. It looks like a really great to tear your meniscus. Great way to tear your, you know, the tendons on your uh, uh, knees. So don't do it, okay? There's no, there's no need for you to do a lotus position and, and tear your knee tendons, okay? It's more natural to sit cross-legged with your, with your feet under your thighs, okay? And that's what you have in First Chronicles 17:16. David did that. Contemplation is concentrating on God, loving God, and fearing God. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2. Focusing on the Lord. You love the Lord. You love the Holy Spirit. You draw near to God, and then he draws near to you eventually. Hopefully, he will. There's a fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9.10, that you have, though. And you're resting and you're concentrating on the Lord. So, really, all you need to do is find a quiet place where you can be all alone. Lay prostrate on the floor or sit cross-legged. Close your eyes. Try to concentrate on God for at least 15 minutes in a row. And, and feel after God with loving reverence. As, as the book of Acts says, that we feel after him. And uh, get a composition notebook. If you experience any psychological or spiritual phenomena, you can journal it. You hear a voice, you see a vision, you see a mental picture popping in the head, that is a vision. It's a closed vision. Um, journal it. Journal it. And you might find that most of the time when you do this, nothing's going to happen. So don't expect stuff to happen right away. But if you get in the habit of doing this on a regular basis, you might just find that you're going to have more Holy Spirit dreams later on, 12 hours later when you go to sleep. It sensitizes you to the Holy Spirit and to the spirit realm. So God bless you out there. Um, I just want to reemphasize there is nothing new age about what I just talked to you about. Okay, and here's here's where the delicate difference exists. It becomes new age when you start incorporating a mental images that come from world religions like Hinduism or Buddhism, or b you start doing physical postures with your body that are from yoga. 
If you can leave those two things out of it and just keep yourself focusing on Jesus, you're not doing New Age Eastern meditation. You're doing Christian contemplation, the kind that's in the Bible, the kind that was perfected by the Catholic saints in Egypt and in Europe, Catholic monasteries. Okay, and that's the Holy Spirit that you're seeking. And, and, and you are not incorporating Buddhist images in your mind. You are not incorporating Hindu gods in your mind. You are not doing any Eastern meditation. Uh, you're not doing any yoga postures with your body whatsoever. You're just simply spending time alone with the Spirit of Jesus. And quiet, locked room, maybe putting some earmuffs on, focusing on the Lord for 15 minutes in a row, sitting in a very comfortable position. That's it. Christian contemplation. Christ-centered contemplation. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12.2. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.